Let's start in verse 12. Colossians 1, 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is, from the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. We'll stop there. So we're starting a study in 1 John. And 1 John is a little bit difficult to uh, understand what it is he's getting at because even though his words are actually quite simple, there is a background that we really don't understand. And that background is called Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a, well, how do you put it? It's difficult. It's a religious system, more or less, based upon Platonic philosophy. Uh, I know that means a whole lot to you. Uh, <clears throat> I explain Platonic. Platonic comes from Plato, from the writings of Plato. Plato recognized that what he saw around him was not good, that evil pervaded everything in the world. Death, dying, corruption, uh, corrupt political stuff going on, just like today. And he said it's all evil. And so a good God could not possibly have created this world. You've probably heard that statement. Uh, Gnosticism comes from the Greek gnosis, from which also our word knowing or knowledge also derives. just going to kind of go through a little primer on Gnosticism with you. Gnosticism is the belief that human beings contain a piece of God or a divine spark. Hey, we've heard that before, right? Everybody has a divine spark within themselves, which has fallen from the immaterial world into the bodies of humans. You know, it was out there, part of, you know, little pieces of God floating around and they kind of fell down to earth and became human beings. All physical matter is subject to decay, rotting, and death. Those bodies in the material world created were created by an inferior being and therefore evil. That's how uh, Plato dealt with the problem of evil. And just from a logical perspective, he, he did a pretty good job. He had no uh, knowledge, likely, of uh, the creation account of the Bible, where it says that God created everything good, and that it, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, corrupted itself. But we're trapped in a material world and we're ignorant of our status, that we're a piece of God that 
fell to earth. Uh, the pieces of God require knowledge, gnosis, to inform them of their true status. See? So we need to be educated about who we really are in the Gnostic system. And that knowledge must come from outside the material world. And the agent who brings it is a savior or a redeemer. So Jesus didn't come to pay the penalty for our sins. He came to inform us. In the second century, some groups uh, were referred to as Gnostic Christians because they kept their Gnostic pattern, their system of belief, but they gave it a Christian vocabulary. They had claimed to have secret knowledge that Jesus took his apostles aside and totally irrelevant of the Gospels that they wrote, he gave them secret knowledge about the nature of the universe, about the nature of who he was, uh, and what his appearance on earth meant to believers. So in spite of the fact that all of the Gospels tell us that Jesus uh, was crucified, that he died, he was buried, and that he arose, they redefine all those things. They look at it a totally different way. Um, Plato understood God more like in the way that Hindus would understand God. God is pervasive of everything. Everything is God. Everything is in God. God is in everything. Uh, but that God did not create anything. Rather, that God had emanations. One of the uh, early philosophers referred to them as uh, eructations, or belches, in other words. Belches of God. Uh, but Plato posited the existence of a second, secondary power he, he referred to as the Demiurge. And he identified the Demiurge, or others later identified the Demiurge, as the Hebrew God, the lesser God who created all material substance. So would uh, Yahweh be then considered a belch? No. <laughs> no, he was a creation of the belch. The Demiurge created matter, the substance of the physical realm. Uh, let's see. Gnostics ask and answer questions like, who am I? Where did I come from? What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is my true self? These are all questions that everybody asks, but the Gnostics came up with different answers than Judea, Judaism or Christianity. Uh, Gnostic theology says that there is a dualism. There is spirit, which is good. There is the material realm, which is bad, evil. Sometimes this is referred to in terms of light and darkness. Hmm, where do we see that? The apostles use those terms. When you see the apostles writing in those terms, they are probably answering Gnostic uh, questions. They're, they're speaking to the Gnosticism that kind of settled into the church in the early days. But the God, the uh, eternal God, is infinite but is not personal. But there's these emanations referred to as aeons and archons. The aeons are the good ones, the archons are the bad ones. Uh, but they emanated, they eructated from this uh, infinite but impersonal God. Kind of like light coming from the sun. Uh, one of the aeons 
was named Sophia, or wisdom. Sophia we think of as a woman's name, but Sophia is wisdom, which has become pers personalized. Uh, in a moment of weakness, Sophia produced the demiurge. Sophia created God, or our God, the, who then created a physical universe, including humans. According to Gnostics, God sent Christ to restore the original cosmos. This is the other, the, the good God. As the divine spark within humans had fallen asleep, Jesus came to wake us up, to wake up our divine spark. Uh, because our divine spark doesn't remember its origins. Humans had to be awakened to the presence of this peace of God within them. Now, we can see as we read through 1 John and also then the writings of Paul and uh, various other places that they were actually speaking to this, these ideas that were coming into the church and assuming a Christian vocabulary but really were not Christians. The Gnostics were condemned as heretics by the church fathers for a number of reasons. Uh, because they promoted a higher God. You know, there's a God beyond God. Uh, this God is pure essence and pure love. It's, that is being the, uh, the true God rather than the one who created the material universe. Gnostics agreed that the creator God in Genesis created the universe, but creation consisted of evil matter. In some Gnostic systems, the God of Israel was not only evil, but Satan himself. So God and Satan were really one and the same. Uh, thus, the commandments of God were deemed invalid. Uh, Gnostics claimed that their teachings came directly from Jesus. See, they liked the idea of Jesus as uh, this uh, aeon that came to help us, to wake us up. In, in those scenes in the Gospels, Jesus takes the disciples aside to better inform them. He also taught secret things that were passed down to them, but see, they didn't write them down. They, they were uh, oral traditions. Consisting of physical matter, the human body was evil. For most Gnostic system, Jesus was not incarnated into a human body. They preached the concept of docetism. That uh, means he only seemed to be a real human being, but he really wasn't. He only seemed to die on the cross. He only seemed to be resurrected from the dead. But it was an illusion. It wasn't real in their system. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 12, I think we have that on the slide. No, I guess we don't. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, that was a question that was being asked. Some, some people in the Christian community said, we don't really want to have anything to do with this doctrine of resurrection because that is a return to the material life, which is evil. But Paul argues that if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. So if you don't believe in the resurrection, you're missing the whole point. A Gnostic, after being awakened, studies the heavens and learns the means to navigate the various layers. In this sense, Gnostics view salvation as an individual matter. 
in learning how to, you know, all the all the spheres and layers of heaven and earth, rather than involving the rest of the community. In other words, salvation could not be achieved through the cross or through laws. Monica. Um, just your definition of Gnosticism and some of the aspects that you're talking about really remind me of the unity and the Unitarian religions. Universal, yes. Universal Unitarian There are elements of Gnosticism in those, but they're not really Gnostic systems. Well, I was wondering, do you know if those religions have the same material things are evil, and the resurrection is evil, they would, they would probably say that those things are irrelevant, that those were really uh, illusions. Matter is really an illusion in a lot of the modern Gnostic yeah. thinking. In Gnostic systems, there is a denial of Christian eschatology. You know, why do we need a physical kingdom? Because with Matter is evil anyway. We want a heavenly kingdom. We want this kingdom in the clouds. That's where this idea came from. It came from the Gnostics. And we do have a few pure Gnostic systems around today. One of them is the Church of Scientology. And I don't want to get into uh, uh, really a discussion of that, but just be aware that that's what they are. Now, rather than a Christian vocabulary, L. Ron Hubbard gave them a science fiction vocabulary. And so they are Gnosticism with a science fiction uh, terminology. We have you know, some Gnostic ideas in things like Christian science. They're, they're not a pure Gnostic system, but they believe that there is no such thing as sin. Sin is an illusion. No, what's you know in practice it's kind of the same thing you really can't do anything evil because it's it's an illusion anyway uh, they believe that Jesus was not God they believe that Jesus is the highest human concept of the perfect man and is not to be worshipped that's Christian science even Mormonism has some echoes of Gnosticism uh, God is, a, is created. The, their doctrine is, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. God was once just a man, and man can become God. So therefore, God, the one we know as God, was created by something further back, something above. Not really sure who it is. So the terminology of, uh, of Gnosticism, we've covered aeons, those are the good emanations, and archons, those are the uh, authorities of darkness who rule our world, shadows cast by the aeons. Uh, resurrection is inner resurrection. It is when you, when you wake up, I guess, in, in their vocabulary being woke, right? Gnostics often shook their heads at true believers for taking the resurrection of Jesus literally. It's a spiritual idea. Uh, I had an Episcopal bishop tell me one day that his, his faith did not require a literal resurrection. Well, if it's not a literal resurrection, what kind of a resurrection is it? his faith was greater than that. Uh, Eve is a, a, a big idea within Gnosticism. Eve is the first Gnostic and the messenger of light who awakened Adam and gave birth to humanity. She is a kind of avatar of the Aeon Protonoia or forethought. <clears throat> when Adam expresses to her his gratitude for being awakened by her, she affirms, I am the forethought of pure light. I am the thought of the virgin spirit who raises you to a place of honor. Arise, remember that you have heard, and beware of deep sleep. Who writes this stuff? 
all this this goes way way back you know, people probably at the time of John were writing this stuff Mike I, I heard something you did that is just profound it's so simple and that is we should probably evangelize and give the gospel more often simply by quoting First Corinthians 15 First uh, Corinthians uh, 15 let me say for I delivered to you uh, the first of okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, for I delivered to you as of first importance, which I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. And then the bottom line is that that is the gospel that we should be presenting to people all the time. And yeah. Let, let God fill their hearts with the meaning of all of that. That's right. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the central uh, truth of Christianity. Without it, it's nothing other than a, a system of good works. Uh, Gnosis is the awakened alternative to, they use the terms uh, hylicism, which is materialism, and psychism, which would be uh, living within your thoughts. Scholar, most scholars would be psychists, according to the uh, to the Gnostics. Jesus was a messenger of light who helped luminous Sophia rescue herself from being caught in the darkness of the lower worlds. Uh, Mary Magdalene figures heavily into Gnostic thought. She's the true receiver of the inner teachings of Jesus. In several Gnostic Gospels, she complains about Peter's obvious hatred of her for being a woman. So, so the woman is the enlightened one. The man needs to be uh, needs to be taught. A messenger of light is a spiritual master, having achieved a high degree of gnosis, is able to ignite a similar capacity in other people. After which he becomes their colleague rather than their teacher. Paul uses the term fullness. Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be attained. Fullness means, it, pleroma in Greek means a number which fills. You know, like if we figured out how many basketballs would it take to fill this room, that, would, that number would be called the fullness. They redefine it. Fullness is the many-layered Gnostic heaven. Emanations of the ultimate hidden godhood reach from heaven to earth. For the Gnostics, heaven is a state of abundance, whereas human existence tends to be characterized by alienation and exile. Yeah. Salvation actually means healthiness, not, not being redeemed. So those are just some of the, the Gnostic... Uh, Term, uh, terms that are used. Um, if you want to look into it yourself, there are all kinds of websites devoted to various types of Gnosticism. They don't all agree with each other, but they all basically contain these basics. So we'll point this out as we go through First John, how he is responding to Gnostic teaching purpose of 1 John in uh, chapter 2 verse 18, John says children, it is, I think we have a slide on this one, you should advance at 1 here we go children, it is the last hour and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming even now many Antichrists have arisen from this we know that it is the last hour. So John was pointing out that there, the church was full of heretics. And he just doesn't really explain to us very well what the heresy is. He says, they went out from us. They, they were part of the church. But they were not really of us. 
for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. That's kind of the theme of the book, a letter. John, 1 John 1.1 1, 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld, and our hands handled concerning the word of life. We know in his gospel, John starts off, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. John's referring to the same thing here, the word of life. And he says, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Jesus, being an eternal being, became truly human. And John says, we saw him. We were with him. He was manifested to us. He came to us. We saw him. And it's our, our job to tell everybody what it was we saw and what we heard. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John was saying we weren't dealing with a a spiritual being who only seemed to be human. He was the real deal. And I'm going to explain to you what he taught. John's essential, essential words. Peter, kind of dealing with the same issue within his sphere of influence, says in 2 Peter 1.16, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Peter is referring to the experience of the transfiguration. Peter was there. He saw it. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure. The words of the prophets mean more to us now because of what we saw and heard on the mountain to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Paul says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is vain. So John, Peter, Paul, all were in agreement that Jesus really did live as a man, even though he is uh, eternal in his very nature. He lived as a man, he died a criminal's death, and he was physically raised from the dead. He was not a spiritual being that only seemed to be human. John says, and this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. He's essentially speaking to the Gnostics about their idea of light and darkness. John is saying, God is light. 
the one the Gnostics think of as the Demiurge, the one who created the evil physical realm. They're saying he's not the light. In the Gospel of John, he says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But he was the true light, not the spiritual light, the ethereal light of the Gnostics. In verse 6, he says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. He's dealing with the issue of sin, where, because Gnostics were, would say that sin doesn't matter. Sin is irrelevant, Monica. Sure. system of Gnostic thought yeah. to get your eyes off of the idea of sin, the idea of God being the creator, right. Jesus being a human being, all of this just flies in the face and it's just like, and what is the hook in human beings that, that gravitate to this garbage load of lies to Gnosticism? What is the hook that human beings want to latch onto that instead of the true gospel? You can and do whatever you want because it doesn't matter. Because you're free to do what you want. Yeah. What did you say, Tim? Because you're free to do what you want. Nobody can tell you boundaries. otherwise. Freedom from any moral boundaries. Yeah. If you wanted to kill everybody in this room, that was okay. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Because the physical realm is evil anyway, so what the heck? And if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Gnostics would say sin is an illusion. There is no sin. You can't sin. It's impossible because the physical world is evil anyway, and our, our job is to find our way out of it. But John goes on to say that if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, we're not lost in that sin. Gnostics would say that, you know, you guys believe in sin, uh, you're trapped in it. You're trapped in that evil world. You're trapped in that evil uh, materialism. But we have an advocate. And he is faithful and just to forgive us Thank our sins. And then he, he ends by saying, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we, like the Gnostics, were to say sin is an illusion, we can do whatever we want, uh, his word is not in us. But I want to go back to verse 7. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. This word fellowship. Now we talk rather loosely about fellowship. Uh, you know, sometimes you know, guys go out on the golf course. Well, women do too with other believers and say, well, we had fellowship. Uh, but, and maybe so, to, to some extent, that would be considered fellowship. But looking around for an example of fellowship, I think of military men on a mission, or astronauts on a mission, you know, heading out to the moon. That would be a good one. Men on a mission like that, and women too, 
uh, have fellowship. They aren't thinking about anything else except the mission. Get through it. And it doesn't matter if they hate each other personally, but they have each other's back. They're going to make sure that everybody does their job, the mission gets completed, uh, and we get to come home. And in the same way, Christianity, Christian fellowship, is we are on a mission. We are all together on this mission to uh, live as believers, to do what the Holy Spirit encourages us to do, uh, and to get through this mission, and to get home. Fellowship. And whatever we need to do to achieve the mission. We're going to do it. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that uh, you have uh, provided us with what is needed uh, for our fellowship. That you have provided us a way to deal with our uh, sin that comes about from living in a fallen world. We know that you created this world good and that we are the ones who messed it up. And yet, we can't really fix it. But you, as our representative, as a true human representative, fixed the problem for us. And Lord, we uh, just once again thank you for all that you have done and Pray, Lord, that you keep us uh, in fellowship. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.